Greetings, cocksuckers. Welcome to Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by my favorite underwear in the world, MeUndies. You heard me talk about them. You know I'm a big believer in their product, and they're the perfect balance of comfort, fit. Every man should have MeUndies. And every month, they got new and exciting prints that arrive at your door in a fun little bag. You don't even know. You think it's a little fucking surprise from somebody. You never know what's going on. MeUndies is great offers for my listeners, all right? For first-time purchases, when you purchase MeUndies, you get 20% off and free shipping. Listen, MeUndies uses lensing micro-modal in their underwear. It's sustainable source, naturally soft fiber that is softer than cotton. I love them. I wear them to jiu-jitsu. They keep everything dry. They keep the nutsack smelling good, and everything's beautiful. MeUndies is so sure you'll love their underwear, they're going to offer you 100% money-back guarantee. But do me a favor. Let's get this show started. Go to MeUndies.com right now slash Joey. That's MeUndies.com right now slash Joey to get you 20% off your first pair, free shipping, and 100% money back guarantee. Number two, Lee lives off these things, and I love them. Blue Apron, I think it's one of the best ideas in the world. You know why? Because they're the number one leading meal key delivery service in the U.S., and a lot of people don't know about them. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service. Why? Because their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everybody. They have a two-person meal plan, a family meal plan. They got it all. If you got a question, they'll solve it for you. What I want you to do is this. Right now, check out this week's menu when you go to blueapron.com. Go to blueapron.com and just check out this week's menu. All right? If you see something you like, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to get you $30 off your first BlueApron.com order by going by BlueApron.com slash Joey. That's BlueApron.com slash Joey. Trust me, Blue Apron, it's a better way to cook. Kick that motherfucking meal, Lee. Fucking John Osborne at his finest. Ricky Rocket, finally, finally. Man, that shit just make, takes me back to, like, kegger parties and, like... You know, when I was discovering all that stuff, man. Jesus yeah. Christ. Back in your days in Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. This all started in Pennsylvania. Like, I thought, you know, if you, when you meet somebody and you see their music and you watch the videos over the years, you go, okay, this started on the Sunset Strip. Ricky's from fucking Orange County. The other guy, the singer, is from fucking San Francisco. And the guitar player is from San Diego. And when I read about you, I'm like, these fucking guys are from Pittsburgh. <laughs> CeCe's from Brooklyn. The, the finalist for the guitar player was between him, Slash, and some other fucking monster. Yeah. You guys went with CeCe, you know. Yeah. Just, uh, just a phenomenal story. Millions of fucking records all over the world, world tours. And now, you know, this is all 86 through 92, whatever. The, 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 the heart of glam rock. Even even longer, ninety a little longer, and then all of a sudden here you are, two thousand seventeen. Well, here's the thing, you know, back in in PA, um, we we were pretty young guys when we put this band together. You know, nineteen, twenty, twenty one years old, and it, it was hard to play bars. I mean, they didn't, you know, we even if we could get in the door and play, uh, that the the generation that was frequenting bars were older. You know what I mean? They were 25, 30, 35, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, so we were appealing to kids. So that's when we, you know, we would play Maryland because the drinking age was only 18 in Maryland at the time. So we did a lot of shows in Maryland. But then we're like, well, we can't just play those same couple of clubs over and over again. So we started to rent VA, VA, let me try this in English, VFW halls, skating rinks, promoter-owned concerts, you know what I mean? And it would be all ages. And we, you know, and then we finally, I mean, we had just done everything that we could do back there. Out here was where hard rock was happening. It was where Motley Crue, Rat, uh, Keel, I mean, all those bands were, you know what I'm saying? And so it, it made sense <coughs> to come here. It made sense to come here. New York was not fertile for it. That was still wrapped up in the whole new wave scene, which was fine. That's just not what we were doing. And uh, Philly was like vocal bands, and it really wasn't a rock scene too much. I mean, arguably, Cinderella came out of there, but um, 
But out here was where we needed to be. And so we moved out here in March of 84. I mean, we had like 2,500 bucks between the four of us. And we just came out and went for it. We're figuring if we're going to sleep on the sidewalk, at least it'll be warm. <laughs> and then one guy couldn't take it, the guitar player, so he'd go. Yeah, he home. got his girl knocked up. And, you know, it just wasn't his... Uh, it just wasn't gelling all the way. You know what I mean? Like, he he's a super good guy. I talked to him once in a great while. Um, and he's a really great guitar player. And, and, I mean, he went through all those clubs with us in the early days and really helped Poison be what it is. But um, invariably, it just wasn't the life for him. He did not like the late nights. And, I mean, we loved to party. You know what I mean? I mean, we, we were just all up in it we'd love to go out every single night party till two in the morning come back change into a pair of jeans and then go out and put flyers up all over town and then sleep till noon and then rehearse and then do the same thing over again and that's what we did we just worked work, this work, is work, once work, you work, got work, to work. la or when you were still when in pennsylvania? We, well in pennsylvania we did we had jobs back in pennsylvania out here we made this our full-time job we did dumb shit like sell pencils for you know and stuff yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but shit. yeah but uh but as far as like i mean we just made it our full-time and then we'd go to like covina west covina and places like that and play cover songs we were a band that were it we were reared on playing cover songs you have to do that back east and then you slip in some original material out here it is an original circuit you come out you play all original material so we're like how are we going to make money so we go to the outskirts of los angeles or even different like arizona and and play bars that we could play cover songs just what we did in pa and we'd make money that way and then we'd put it back into our flyers and and our promotion and you know uh we worked really 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 hard i mean we were like the kind of guys that um if we all worked at the same restaurant, we would have owned it in a couple of years. I mean, we just had it hair up our ass. We were on fire, you know, and we were determined, really, really, really determined. What was the first club you got into here on the... Uh, the first place we ever played was Madame Wong's West. That's not there no more. It's not there anymore. It's gone. Yeah. And who, and like, you, you, it was you guys, Motley Crue... Who was, well, who was, Motley Crue was already, already signed. They had huge. played the U Us Festival. I mean, they were well on their way. They were a c couple albums in by the time oh, we, that's we right. ever Motley got out. Motley Crue did do Us because Shot with the Devil came out in 83, 84. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We moved out right. here in March of 84. <clears throat> so, yeah, they they definitely had uh, were ahead of, of us and, uh, and Rat. And when we got here, they said, you know, it... it it was like, you know, we were being told that that music is getting really, really, really heavy. That's where it's going. And if we were going to do anything, we had to go really heavy. And we weren't. We were a rock and roll band. I mean, we were like part Aerosmith, part Van Halen, part Kiss, part, you know, whatever. You know, we had all those roots, and, and we liked playing rock and roll songs. Who were your not, influences growing up? So Bass. much stuff. God, so much stuff. I mean, everything from, from Zeppelin to Matha Hoople to everything in between Fucking my first concert hoople. my first concert believe it or not was herb albert and the tijuana brass all right at the allentown fair um so i love all kinds of music you know and my dad was a trumpet player my mom loved elvis you know my sister was a hippie she was nine years older than me so she had grateful dead going and here i came along you know what i mean my first record that i ever bought was deep purple made in japan oh you know and still to this day highway star and all yeah, those songs yeah, are just yeah, and yeah, ian yeah. pace is this fucking I mean, what a drummer. <laughs> Come on, man. I'm and he fucking still fucking just takes it to fucking China. We were just, uh, somebody was on here and we were just did the, when they got back together, that video. Oh, yeah. Da -da 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 I forget what the name of the song was. I'll tell when you what. Deep Purple got back to you? Yeah, something. They did something recently. Not recently, uh, a couple of years back. You know, I feel guilty because I have not kept up with Deep Purple, but I saw Deep Purple at the uh, Farm Show Arena in Harrisburg, and Tommy Bolin was playing guitar for them. It's when uh, Blackmore left, and Tommy Bolin, who was fucking phenomenal amazing. phenomenal phenomenal i mean just another level i gotta uh, tell you something fucking richie blackmore has always given me the fucking creeps 
I can't lie to you. He he gives me, and I've seen him. I saw him, I think, twice. I saw him in 82 when Rainbow did the Scorpions, uh, Breakout, Blackout. Yeah, 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 fucking Blackout. Thing. Yeah, I saw, I saw that tour. And I saw that tour. I saw that tour with Judas Priest. Uh, no yeah, shit. And Crocus, yeah. Because I saw <laughs> awesome. them. It was the Scorpions and them, uh, Rainbow, with the... Uh, Joe Linterna, who was really Joe Linguido yeah. from Cliffside Park, New Jersey. Yes. It's so fucking Joe funny. Joe Linterna is a hell of a singer, though, dude. You know, he's, he's still like, out there. Yeah, he's, he's, he's still he's, fucking doing it. I mean, but did you see what Richie Blackmore looks like now? I haven't I haven't seen him. You know what? I, I, I've never wanted to meet him because I've heard stuff about right, him. That right, he was, he was, so I'm like, I don't even... You know, I don't try to meet people anymore because... I've been let down a few times, and I just don't even want to bother. If somebody wants to say hi to me, I'm open. I'm really an easy guy to get along with. But I, people have left me down, man, you know, and I just, so I just. Uh, like people you looked up to, you yeah. thought over the years you went up to. It. Earlier we were talking about jujitsu people versus musicians. Musicians, musicians drive me nuts. Jujitsu people are solid, <laughs> you know. So if somebody's a musician and a jujitsu person, they're usually fairly solid because the jujitsu part takes over that asshole musician part. <laughs> so we have uh, we have uh, we have twenty mutual friends, but the main one is John. John Salami is is family, and I love John. He, uh, he's uh, he's a, he's a misunderstood person. <coughs> let me tell you something. He's a great. Dude. He's a very very creative professional. He's yeah, a bad motherfucker. Yeah. I love him with all my heart. I torment him three days a week. <laughs> I call him names. Today I called him at 6 in the morning. You know, I torment him. And uh, he gave me for a birthday present a Higan Machado seminar. At, uh, uh, and that's the first time I saw you on the mat. And I mean, I was struggling. I was embarrassed to be there. I even popped like uh, the shroom tech, like I popped two of them. So that made my heart even worse. Like I was really struggling with jujitsu. And there's Dan and Asanto. There's you, there's, uh, you know, you're a professor now. You know, just the fact that you put me in the same sentence with Danny and Asana yeah. was pretty amazing. I, mean, I was, <laughs> I was dying. Because he gets put in the same sentence as Bruce Lee, so I don't even know how yeah, I deserve that. No, but it was weird because <laughs> here I was, you know, a, a thousand pounds overweight, and people were coming up to me going, hey, put your foot here. Or, Dude, everybody came over and said, you're doing this. You're a big guy. Do this, you know. Yeah. And I left there like embarrassed, but at the same time I felt good. But you were great. Like you said something to me about my arm. Put your arm here, uh, over here. You'll get more leverage. I never forgot that. Huh. And then two weeks later, I walk into an airport, and who's sitting there like a, a lonely person? But Ricky Rocket. And I go up to you and I go, I don't know if you remember me from the seminar. We were delayed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 11 hours. We we got delayed because there was a thunderstorm. We landed in fucking, we had to do an emergency landing in uh, somewhere in Oklahoma. Yeah. Then they flew us into Dallas. Yeah. And in Dallas, I caught the, I lost you at the airport. Right. Every right. man for himself. I, I love you, Ricky now. Rocket, but every, every man for himself. <laughs> we got to get to LA. <laughs> and I lost you uh, because we were, all, we were all switching flights and we didn't know if we had to spend the night in Dallas. And, yeah, and I, I remember lost that you. now. Yep. Yeah. And I remember telling John, I go, Can you believe I see him at a seminar? I see him two weeks later. He's the nicest fucking guy in the world. And in Higgin, you mentioned Higgin. I Higgin. love, I yeah. love Higgin. Higgin, you know, I've always said this. I, I you know, what do, what doesn't what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Except Hagen, he'll just kill you. He'll just kill you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no. But no, he, I love him, man. He's just uh, he's just such a free spirit. I mean, you know, it's like in, he could have, to me, he could have been a heavyweight UFC champ if he would have wanted to do that in his life. I mean, what's he like, 200 to one defeats or something like that? Yeah, like he's, something he's, ridiculous. I heard he used some to submit people number. from his side control. He, 16 guys in one day, in one tournament. He he got submitted, by the way. One day. He submitted he 16 He submitted guys. 16 guys and took the title. He's gone into Sambo championships and won Sambo championships. I mean, he's incredible. I mean, and all the Machado brothers have done that stuff. You know, that was the, you know, they... All around the world, they were doing that stuff. Who does nothing but Brazilian jiu-jitsu and then goes in a sambo and wins against a guy that's done nothing but sambo? I mean, he got to be a special 
kind of athlete, you know, to do that. It's amazing. His, his resume is incredible. And all those guys, I mean, Hicks on, all those guys were doing that stuff. They were just, we're going to rule the world. I mean, that was, and they did, you know. You started uh, 2000 when we were discussing this. Yeah. And it's funny because I'm not here to break your balls, break anybody's balls, but uh, uh, the members of Poison, no, there was an original name before you came out here. Yes. What was that? Paris. Paris. And then yeah. when you came out here, you're like, we, we ain't from fucking Paris. Yeah. No. <laughs> We're fucking it, poison cocksuckers. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so funny how uh, the members from, uh, uh, you know, your band used to get into fisticuffs with one another. Yeah. You're like in 91 of the MTV Music Awards or something. Yeah. So I figured one day Ricky Rapman said, you know what? Before shit goes to Ricky Rocket said, before shit gets deep, I'm going to get into martial arts just in case. <laughs> things come over here I could fuck people up and not feel guilty <laughs> so you joined because you know there was uh, how many fights were there oh, there was always fight. but you know what most of the time we were on each other's sides we at the beginning I always tell people this at the beginning of our career for the first even five years people didn't know what to make of us they wanted to either fuck us or fight us I mean when we went into a town literally uh, we got in so many fights and our record company didn't know how to deal with it. They suppressed everything. Guns N' Roses, they would, they, they, you know, they just argue with somebody and they'd put it in the press. Us, our, our record company put everything. And maybe it was for the best, who knows. But, um, but the reason I got into martial arts, seriously, I mean, I always loved Bruce Lee and that stuff. But when I came out here, we had a scenario where uh, a guy tried to stab me and a guy with a, with a, a bumper off of a Volkswagen tried to stick Bobby Doll right on the street uh and on Washington Boulevard in LA right right down here yeah and I thought I was gonna die that night and I swore to myself I'm gonna learn how to defend against a knife because I could have died if a, a cop wouldn't have come around the corner and they saw the cop that wouldn't have happened the guy would have stuck me and he was fucked up his eyes were I mean he looked like I mean he was gonna he was going to get me. Um, and I, I get freaked out just thinking about it because I didn't know anything really back then. I mean, I took a couple karate classes and I wrestled in school, but I wasn't going to beat a guy with a knife who was on drugs. That wasn't going to happen. Um, and who knows? I might not now either, but, um, but I'd have a fighting chance now. But then I was just like, you know, right at that moment I made that decision. I'm going to learn something. So when I did have some money and some time, I, I went after uh, Cass Magda, who was Danny Anasano's assistant for years, 15 years, JKD guy, Bruce Lee stuff, uh, Filipino martial arts, C-Lot, Muay Thai, had that mix of martial arts, a lot of knife fighting, that's what I went for. So for five years, I did knife fighting, stick fighting, all that kind of stuff. And then there was, I'm telling you, my martial arts story. No, I want to hear And then there was a guy that came in and did a seminar with Harry Mar... Let me try that one more time. Harry Mal C-Lot. And it's a sort of a ground game type of C-Lot. And I went... That put me in touch with my wrestling background a little bit. And then I saw Hoist Gracie in the UFC. And I went, look at this. This is coming around full circle. It isn't just about standing up and striking I mean I feel comfortable when I clinch I feel comfortable when I'm on the ground more than when I'm not what am I doing trying to just strike you know what I mean and uh, so when I got the opportunity to go to the Machado Brothers school uh, I thought I'd do fine I got tapped out 14 times that day I remember it like it was yesterday and I went this is where I need to be and I mean I just never looked back that was 17 years ago uh, my first private that I ever did was with John Jock. And uh, and then I started to train with Hanato. Um, and Hanato Magno. Uh, and then I'd do the regular classes. And then sometimes I'd do privates. And then sometimes I'd do regular classes. And I did a combination of both all the way. And still, I still do it that way. I still do privates, you know. Uh, and I still do group class. It just depends on my time, you know what I mean. And now I'm even busier than I was then, oddly enough. I'm semi-retired rock musician, and I have less time than I did then. But 
That's how it goes, right? When you have kids, retired. Yeah. And you have children, and you mm-hmm. were divorced and remarried. And I mean, you went through the last couple of years after I saw you on that flight, like your life changed dramatically one day. You got yes. the news. Yes, yes. How did you feel when... We're talking know, about the rape uh, allegation, right? Right, right. Yeah, yeah back in... We now played, we would be... Oh, God. We'd be dead, like, if it would happen. You know what? The people need to, like... We'll get to that what in a, a second. What a weird but fucking story. It was very weird. And to this day, I don't completely understand who this person really, truly was. I know quite a bit about her from the private investigator. But, um, okay, so what happened was we did... Uh, New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand, or not Auckland, uh, Wellington, New Zealand, and it was called Rock to Wellington, a big festival over there. We played that, and it's like a fourteen. I mean, it's like a two-hour drive to get to the airport. It's fourteen-hour drive uh, flight, and that, you know, I mean, it's like it kills you, right? And I remember Zach. I sat with Zach Wild, um, and um, he got drunk, passed out, <laughs> as he should. But we're in line, right, at LAX when we got off to get our bags, right? And a guy came up and said, I, I need to see you. I need to take you to the front here. And Zach goes, whoa, it looks like somebody's tour manager pulled a favor. And I'm like, yeah, that's cool. But I get to go to the front of the line. Well, they took me in a room and handcuffed me. And I went, "What? what is this about? For two hours, they would not tell me what was going on. I, and I had one hand on my cell phone. I'm texting my tour manager until they took it from me. But at least I eked out a text to him, right? And so he came and tried to figure out what was going on. And they said, LA, or, uh, LAPD, we'll, we'll talk to you when you get here. Have you been in any problems with anybody? And blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, I got in an argument with somebody. I, uh, no, I, I don't know. Um, the police came. And started to question me. Have you had a situation with somebody? And I said, well, I had a former partner uh, that I was in the drum business with. And we got it, had some words at NAM. And he goes, no, 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 this is criminal. Mister, you're under arrest for rape. And I went, what? I'm like, this is some kind of fucking joke. Like, you're married at this time. You're, no, I was engaged. Okay, you're engaged. And I, I mean, I'm looking around for cameras. Like, I'm seriously thinking I'm getting fucked with. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I didn't, you know. Um, and uh, so they, they took me in. They started asking me a bunch of questions. Uh, and I didn't know how to answer most of them because I really seriously didn't know what the fuck was going on. I really didn't. And they asked me, they said, what names have you gone by? Aliases. And... Uh, I said, well, um, you know, I've gone by a bunch of dumb names, dick itches and all kinds of stuff, you know, at hotels. And he goes, what about John Minskoff? And I went, no, I don't know that name. But I remembered it when he said it to me. I was like, why was he the cop saying this to me? So we got a lawyer. Lawyer came down. I thought they were going to extradite me to Mississippi because it turns out that this allegation came out of Mississippi, which we had played there once that year. Uh, but a different part of the state we played in. And it was in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Now, if you do some research on Philadelphia, Mississippi, it's where Mississippi burning happened, by the way. Okay, that's the town. That's the area, okay, for reference. Uh, so it's kind of a place, it's, 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 it's uh, as it turns out, it is a, uh, there's a casino there. And it's kind of a destination. You don't just pass by it. You got to, like, drive to it. You know what I mean? Um I've never been there in my life to this casino to this day. Um, and uh, so I didn't know what they're talking about. I'm like, I don't know what the Silver Star Casino is. I don't know who John Minskoff is. I don't know. So five o'clock in the morning, they cut me loose. You know, the guy comes, the cops come in, go, you got to get yourself to Mississippi and get that straightened out. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm getting extradited. I'm like. I'm going to be in a jail in Mississippi. Like, this ain't good. And I said, no, 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 no. You're out in the fucking street, but you need to take care of your shit. And I went, okay, fine. I walk out the door, right? And I'm like, now what do I do? I called my girlfriend. She had taken 10 Xanax to calm down, couldn't drive. (laughs) I'm in the middle of LA somewhere trying to figure out how to get home. Anyway, I get home and I start just data mining the name John Minskoff. Who is John Minskoff? I come up with a million things, million things. All of a sudden, I hit pay dirt. 
that there was a John Minskoff that had been arrested, okay, for telling a 15-year-old that he was a photographer for White Snake and that he would do the, in, in one of his interviews after being arrested for it, he actually kidnapped the girl for three days. He went to jail uh, for a period of time and he said that him and his friends used to always impo- uh, pretend they were different rock stars to try to get laid, okay? I went, bingo, this has got to be the fucking guy, okay? Because it ain't me. I didn't rape anybody. I haven't even been to Mississippi, except for one show, which was not in that part of the state, like I said. So I told my lawyer right away, I said, there's this guy, okay? And they said, okay, we're going to look him up. In the meantime, you're doing a lie detector test right away. And if it's good, we're going to use the data. We can't use it in court. But uh, and if it's bad, we're never going to talk about it. And I said, okay. I did the lie detector test, which took all day. I've never done anything like that. Guy called my lawyer and said, this guy is like flying colors telling the truth. He doesn't know anything about this, you know. And so my lawyer was very happy about that because he didn't want to weigh in on it. Um, And so then they started to track down this John Minskoff guy. And we hired a private investigator to go to the Silver Star Casino in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and figure out who this person was. So... The best that we can put it together after all this time was there was a guy that was a piano player and singer who was playing at that casino, told a girl there that he was me, okay? And I don't know why I don't play piano, so I don't, (laughs) this is the part I can't put together, okay? But maybe she was dumb, I don't know. Um, But there is video of her going into a room with this guy and then later coming out there was another guy that was in the room too he walked out she said that was brett michaels by the way uh so brett was there apparently too uh, according to this woman and that i anally raped her and abused her and all this kind of stuff and uh, she filed three different times by the way and they're doing everything they can and so we ran just the logistics like Like, let's pretend that I really wanted to go to Philadelphia, Mississippi, find somebody, rape them, and fly back to Los Angeles, okay? How would all that work, okay? So we put together this trajectory of that day, okay? Uh, And that day, by the way, I happened to be with my fiance helping her pick out wedding dresses because like, you have to sign in at one of these places, right? So that was two in the afternoon, so I would have had to flown all night, and driv- driven like two hours. Like it was some ridiculous thing. I would have had to go in, like get it done and get back on a flight that had no delays. And I mean, there was like no way you could even do it. You know, and the district attorney looked at it and said, I can't even indict this guy. And I'll indict fucking anybody. But I can't indict this guy. It's it's not even not possible. To fly back to Mississippi at all? I did not have to. Thank God, you were smart. But it took like six weeks for the for the DA to get to my case, and because he had like murder cases and all this stuff, and he's listening to some testimonies from not woman that was trying to make money basically, because what they found out was that she had hired two different uh, civil attorneys because they knew they weren't going to get me on. Real, any real charges because there wasn't anything. I didn't do anything. I never met her in my life. Uh, but maybe they could twist my arm hard enough that they could get other lawyers to come in and try to get me to just give them shut up money. And I said, fucking no way. I didn't, I never met this person. I've never been in that part of the state. I didn't have anything to do with this. I've never raped a person in my life. I got nothing to do with this at all. Somebody is stealing my identity and they're the ones that either did it like actually raped her or she just came up with a story because her husband got wind of it and now they're after right. money. I don't know. I think because they were in cahoots. Her and the husband did go to the police together. That much I know. And I know he filed Chapter 11 a couple times. He had a, a car uh, car lot, a used car lot or something like that. Um, I So to this day, I still don't know who the girl is. I know her name, but I've never met her. I've never seen what she looks like. Um, and I've never been to that casino. And for the life of me, why I would get picked and singled out is beyond me. I was just fucking unlucky. You know what I mean? I think Rock of Love was on at the time. Uh, and 
maybe if she would have picked Brett, it would have been too obvious because he was right there on the TV. So let's pick somebody else from the TV, sh- uh, from the band, the same band. I don't know. I, I mean, this is all guesses. I really don't know what her line of thinking was. Or maybe it was the guy that told her and she believed him. Or maybe it was, a, I don't know. I don't Fucking know. crazy to crazy. get off a plane, get pulled over, and to be basically, I mean, you know, on the other terms, they would have charged you, put you in L.A. County, told Mississippi extradited you. You would have had to go over there and make bail, which you would have never made. Because you I spent no every cent I made. Uh, to, to pay my lawyer and more. No, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was you know a what I mean. Nightmare. Um, and the other thing was is that uh, um, it made it so hard for me because we were getting ready to go overseas to do some other shows too, and you know they don't like you leaving the country when you're under investigation like that. I remember I was in uh, a Target looking for something i don't know and this woman who you could tell she was like my age group somebody that would like poison you know what i mean kind of rock looking she had a little, her little girl with her and i look over and she recognizes who i am and grabs her little girl's hand and beelines it the other direction because she saw me and she heard about that charge that broke my heart more than almost anything to f- for somebody to actually think that I would do that and to be treated like that, you know what I mean? Because that ain't me. I ain't, I do. Not, I, I've never raped anybody. Um, and uh, and 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 I was uh, coming out with my first signature symbol, and stores wouldn't carry it. And I mean, you you are definitely guilty until proven innocent. And uh, no, and worse now. Like you said, you were starting to talk about it just a second ago. You better fucking believe it. Nowadays, <laughs> done. Done, yeah, whether done. it's true or not. No. Once right. they read it on print, it's fucking true. Like, that's what's crazy about those type of allegations. That once people, it's like, have you ever written something about yourself, like a book? No, I plan like on doing that, you, though. Wait till you write the part in, of being in Pennsylvania and the stuff you and Ricky, uh, you and uh, Brett did and how you hooked up with Mike and blah, blah, blah. When you read it, Never mind thinking about it. Once you read it, there's times you have to put your pen down, take your glasses off, and go, wow. I can't believe I did that. You know, you just said before about the schlepping when you first got here. Yeah. Who does that shit? Right. People with a dream, but a fucking... You don't know how... You won't know how strong... Because I'm trying to write, write a book. And there's days I have to take a day off from what I wrote the day before and read. Because whatever I thought about it, it hit me a little harder once you right, read it. Right, sure. <clears throat> and that's the problem that we have today, that, listen, we started, you know, uh, the Me Too pro- thing started a crazy thing now. So now right. guys are walking around scared, you know, women are walking around fucking scared, and there's going to be a lot of fake allegations in the next couple of years. Well, as it turns out, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of police, and, you know, so many rape allegations aren't true to begin with which really sucks <coughs> for the people that truly have do get been raped, raped right okay because you know they they have it hard enough as it is trying to come forward okay and the me too thing i think it's i think it's great but now people it's human nature are going to take advantage of that and try to make a name for themselves with it. Now, I, I wouldn't want it. If I was a woman, I wouldn't want to be a Me Too person, you know, unless it really fucking happened to me, you know? And I wish these women would realize that when they do that, and it's not true, they are doing such a disservice to the truly, to the people that truly were taken advantage of. You know what I mean? Because, you know, the, you shouldn't do that, really. I mean, Weinstein or what was, you know, am I saying his name? Weinstein, yeah, yeah Weinstein. Um, I mean, come on. Lee Harvey. You know, yeah. <laughs> Lee Harvey, the fucking shooter. I mean, you know, I mean, it's, you know, come on. You know, it's weird. He, he can't get away. He shouldn't get away with that shit. But, you know, at the same time, people should not be able to get away with faking it either. That's bullshit, too. <sighs> you know what I mean? God, where in the fuck? Where is truth in this world anymore? I mean, it's it's just like, and I don't like to get. I'm very apolitical because 
our audience, I do not like separating our audience because we have people from all walks of life that like our music. And the thing that brings us together is our music. Okay, and our love for music, our love for a good time, and that what that feels like when you when you play or enjoy music together. So the last thing I like to do is bring politics into my world because it does nothing but destroy it. But like with this march that just happened, the thing I like about it more than anything is at least it has people talking about that subject. And what it's done is it's made people show their ass on both sides of the aisle. I've seen people on both sides of that argument, and I'm sitting there going, Can you, I cannot believe that you said that on both sides. I'm like, I, There's people I don't even want to be friends with because it, it doesn't even matter what the politics are. I'm just sitting there going, I can't believe you just fucking said that. That's how you really feel. Huh? How old are your children now, Rick? If you don't Mine are, uh, I have my girl's five and my boy's eight. He'll be nine in a month. I gotta ask you from your heart. Are yeah, you, do you worry ever, ever? I mean, I have my his school was locked down a few weeks ago. Oh, Jesus Christ! So I took him, dropped him off at school, right, and then uh, took my little girl. She goes to a preschool. Took her to preschool. I get the call just as I'm getting back in my car from dropping her off. I had to beeline it back to Jude's school, and uh, by the time I got there, the police were not letting us in not letting them out and i'm sitting there going what the fuck is going on here you know what i mean and and a lot of parents are freaking out and i'm like look don't freak out they they're they are doing the best job they can do right now i mean you got cops wall to wall here right but nobody knew what was going on and they're like why can't they tell us what's going on i'm like they can't because as soon as you do that, then the criminal changes their story. That's why, you know. <laughs> so uh, I get that. Um, and but it was so frustrating not to be able to just go fuck it. I can I know that fifteen feet away that my little boy's in there, and I can just go grab him. Like why can't I just go do that right now? You know what I mean? That's a very frustrating feeling. But it was all this, you know, uh, see monkey see monkey do stuff, you know. If somebody else is doing it and they're getting notoriety, then I'll get notoriety if I do it too. What was uh, the cause of the lockdown? It was a kid who's 15 years old. He was one of the older kids, obviously. And uh, he told somebody at school that the next day he was going to come in and shoot up the school. And then he didn't show up for school the next day. And so they went and looked for him, and he wasn't at home. He wasn't at home, and he hadn't checked into school. So they don't know where he's at. You know what I mean? And uh, so that's where it all came from. And I don't know any more than that yet. He's going to be, I know he had to face a judge probably, I think this week, actually. Uh, So we'll see. We'll see what his motivation. I mean, uh, maybe he was just kidding, maybe whatever. But, you know, people need to realize you cannot kid about that shit. (laughs) You You have a five-year-old like I do. You're 56, correct? Yeah. Jesus, you were slinging dick at 51. Like, yeah, I was. Because yeah. I had mercy at 50. You know, I knocked my wife up legally at 49. <laughs> but I, I had mercy at 49 and a month late. She's January 8th. I think I'm February 19th. You, you know, know, sometimes I wonder that. Like, is there should be, like, you know, you, you should knock somebody up when they're too young. Like, should you be a point where you shouldn't knock somebody up when you're old enough? I mean, maybe, seriously, think about it. I'm going to be an old guy by the time my kids get out of high school. I'm an old guy now. You know, so you sometimes I at, feel bad about it. You Thank don't you. Look, remember, in today's America, the 55 year old and 60, they're looking 45. I mean, a guy like you trains three times a week. And one of the toughest things you could do, and you're going at it with Renato, who's no fucking white belt, you know. So, I, I believe the same thing too. I, when I first came here, I got infatuated with the comedy bug, and I forgot about everything. Even though I came from a martial arts background and lifting weights, I just, you know, the late night, you go to fucking Mel's or uh, uh, Pink's, and you get a sandwich and your French fries, and the next thing you know, it's four hundred fucking pounds. And then I lost weight, and then I joined. Finally, joined jujitsu, which I was. I never want to touch a man's foot, and I never want a man's ass in my face. I was always a karate guy, kickboxing. When I went down and watched what Eddie was doing, I'm like, listen, 
The first time Ricky Rocket puts his ass in my face to try to get a Camaro, I tap and I shoot him in the fucking head. <laughs> like, that's how I thought. Like, you can do whatever you want, just don't put your ass in my face. Now I love it. I walked in there and got this addiction to just jujitsu, even though I'm fucking horrible, Ricky Rocket, because it doesn't matter. My first seven years of comedy, I was mumbling, stumbling along. It's like when you're a drummer and you've been playing for two years, all of a sudden a band signs you. You gotta get, you gotta go from level A to level B. Right. right. But sometimes it takes time, and I'm patient. Yeah. This is what comedy taught me to be patient. The whole thing is just keep showing up. Yeah. If you keep going to that mat, just keep going. You'll get drilled for two years, three. I still, I got beat up today. Well, it's like I'm figuring out my vlog. Like I, I finally started a YouTube channel. What made you do all this stuff? I started doing the vlog because I'm, I geek out on stuff. I love cameras, I love drones, motorcycles, motorcycle gear, all that shit. And I'm like, if I do a vlog, I can talk about it because every day I'm going on YouTube watching some, you know, some guy talk about why I should get this drone or this jacket sucks or don't get this helmet or, you know, and, and it helps. I mean, it helps you make a decision, you know, otherwise you're just reading ads, right? And, uh, and I thought, I just geek out on stuff so much. I want people to see, that's why I named it, you know, Ricky Rocket Vlog, Drummer, etc. Yeah, I'm a drummer, but it's the other part that you don't know about all this shit that I'm interested in and that I, you know, I love gear. I'm a gearhead. I love all that shit. You know what I mean? Now, who gave you the name Ricky Rocket? Uh, well, my name's Richard, you know, right, right, so right. Ricky was, you know, came right along with it. But uh, uh, Rocket, I, I worked for a hairdresser and... My job, okay, I, it was just a summer job, okay, and my job was to greet the patron, okay, uh, wash everything, and the you know all the perm rods, the combs, the all that stuff, clean up, sweep hair, just really the shit job is what what it was. Take the person's coat. Where was this? In PA, in okay. Central PA. And uh, Billy Campbell, uh, heterosexual, by the way, uh, just taught me how to talk to people and how, how to move really, really quickly. And he said he never saw anybody move their ass that fast. I was like a fucking rocket. And I would seriously just, you know, he'd say, Mr. So-and-so is coming in today. He likes Playboy and he likes a ham sandwich with, you know, whatever. And, you know, so and I would run out and I'd get it and everything would be ready for that client. And I'd get ready for the next client. And I made his life easier. And so I got called the rocket man because I would just bam, bam, bam. You know what I mean? Um, and I learned a lot about life and hustling by that. I, because the more I did it, the better tips I got. Better tips I got, the better more I could party and the more drums I could buy. So <laughs> that was, that was uh, and then I really fell in love with that business. I was like, man, you can like be around girls all day. I don't have to be out in the heat like laying tar or something like that like i don't want to do that right and uh so i i turned around i went to beauty school and got my my license you in did beauty culture yeah and uh so i and i was like should i get a barber license should i get a, now this a, is all pre-paris oh yeah oh this is during paris. well it was during a little bit part of it i was always in bands i've been in bands since i was like 12 okay uh i always wanted to play but i had to make a living too you know what i mean and i didn't know if that was going to work out for me or not you know what i mean i uh, anytime i could pick music over anything i picked music over anything over anything literally you know that's why i think it took me so long in life to have a family is because i chose it over family yeah, I felt like there wasn't enough room in my life to do both. And I didn't meet the right, I thought I didn't meet the right person and all that kind of stuff. Really, it was me that wasn't ready. Um, but um, but I'd like to say that I had didn't meet the right person. I was just trying to get laid. That's all it was. <laughs> all those years. <laughs> all those years. All, just, just, let's pretend just to fall off of Brett Michaels. I mean, I would get pussy every night. I'd just hang up by the bathroom and watch them cry as they didn't get to meet Brett. Come here, let me talk to you. <laughs> let me show you something. That just was the, you? The, <laughs> just the Brett fall off. Mm -hmm. Just to yeah. hang out. Like, do you know Brett? I, I kind of know him. Could you talk to him a little bit for me? I really like to meet him. Well, 
you know, I usually do it, but Brett wants me to try you out first. Like, I'd be, I'd be the creepy guy, you know what I'm saying? Just would fall off of yeah. Brett. Uh, we would, I was going to ask you about your little girl. Uh, you like me, or I like you, because you're the fucking savage. You saw the other side of life uh, from this woman who uh, allegedly said you raped her to all those years on the road. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you went home a lot of nights and held your head and said, what the fuck just happened? You know, what did I just say? I live in the same boat as you do. I mean, my little girl is my world, you know? Well, you know what? It, uh, I always say this, that Lucy, uh, um, my little girl, was, you know, and Jude's a miracle, obviously, too. But Lucy, uh, I think, came along um, in my life when I least expected it. And I think that there's like some lesson in her. Can I might wait, think I was waiting for mercy. <sighs> What's that? I, I was I was with my wife for 13 years. When that you think I like I expected mercy to show up? <laughs> I just threw my wife a stab, and then that was the day I probably I had knee surgery, <laughs> and I started doing squats, drinking protein powder, and between the GNC protein powder and the squats, it rejuvenated the. I mean, I was with my wife. Yeah, for listen to years. this. This is a GNC commercial. This is a GNC. <laughs> I tell them I go to GNC still. Because after all those years, the whey protein got my wife knocked up. Wow! Between yeah. the squats and the whey that, protein, that, the, the squats, the squats and drew the, the, the testosterone, the testosterone yeah. up. So yeah. I got my wife. Did you stop drinking whey protein? I just drank it before I came. Now I even text Ricky and said I'll be there in seven. Can I sit where you are? You get it in between us, please. Trust me, he farts. <laughs> I, don't need, I don't need to be any closer to him. So you were saying, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. I, I just think that Lucy came along like, I still not sure what the lesson is completely, but I think it has a lot to do with, uh, I mean, I've always respected women, honest to God. I, I, I know a lot of people say, oh, give me a fucking break. But really, um, uh, and but I think she's taken it to another level. I want people to treat my little girl with respect. Have I treated every girl with the same kind of respect I want to see her treated with? I don't know. I wanted to get laid, right? So, um, which is normal. I mean, you know, there's nothing weird about that. But did I just like, like, is there something that I, I'm going to learn? And I think I, I am learning it. Um, that I, I, I've never, it's like when you have a little girl, and I think you're going to agree with this, you endear somebody it, it, it's the most endearing you can be to somebody with nothing else attached to it. Look at that. Who would make me wear this? <laughs> you could come he, here with a he gun. No, I, I, you could come here with a gun. And did say, you make that for her? No. And the best part about it is she's been gone for a week. She's not here. She's not here. Oh. But she gave me this with I, the look in her eye. It was like it took her like. Like somebody said to me that, I said, like, "Who made that for you, your little girl?" Like, "Oh no, an intelligent stripper." <laughs> yeah, my little fucking girl made yeah. it for me. And it took she, like she, like the teacher told me in school, she's like, she made you the matching necklace ensemble bracelet. So I got out of wearing the bracelet, but when she gave me the thing, you know the feeling. Yeah. You know the feeling. Mm -hmm. Your heart stops. I mean, I could be on the computer d deep. Deep. I got Judas Priest hell bent for leather on. I'm answering Ricky on Twitter. I'm sending an email back. I'm making notes in a notebook. And she'll just come in the room, like, get on my lap and go, Daddy, put on uh, Octonauts. And that's it. No, no, you're done. Like, whatever I was thinking Lucy about. Lucy will cry and do something and come over and hug me, and I'll be like, oh, Lucy. And my girlfriend will go, you know she's working here right now. That's and what I'll my be wife like, says to me, yeah. Yes, I do know that I'm working here. <laughs> yeah, my <laughs> wife goes like this. My <laughs> wife will go like this from far away. Yes. Sucker, I'm doing yeah, an S yeah, with my hand. Yeah, Whenever I'm I know, doing something, I know. my I'm wife like, will come from the other side and go, Oh my God! You know, I took her out to. You know, <laughs> if I'm in town, listen, we're gone so much. You know, on the weekends that when I'm home Saturday, I catch a, a 9 a.m. kickboxing class. I get out at 10:15. I get to meet the boys, sweat out the THC. I go home. I go home. I pick her up, and I take her and the mother for breakfast. You know, a pancake restaurant. Right. And then I drop the mother off, and I take her. Aren't you glad he just didn't say, like, I'm sweating out the meth? 
Well, I, you know, I mean, that would just <laughs> suck. He, well, yeah. he, he left out a part. He <laughs> spreads out the THC to put more good. in. It's Good Friday, so I didn't stop and get edibles for me. Oh. Like, I was going to stop and get us a 200 edible, the body of Christ. I appreciate it. Do you realize uh, Easter is on April Fool's Day this year? Yes. Like what? what and am we're I doing gonna a put, what, I'm going to like wrap like eggs. <laughs> and, and, uh, I mean. Uh, uh, um, Grapes and and wrap and give it to my kid and say, hey, that's a little egg. Uh, April Fools. I mean, you know, wow, that's weird. But anyway, it is what it is. I've never been like, I was like never the fun holiday for me. Easter, it was okay, but it's like you eat some chocolate, you have dinner, and then now what? Everything's closed. You know, <laughs> you know, it's not supposed to be fun. When you get older, it's supposed to be more serious. You know what I mean? But. I could have gone home with my wife and my daughter to Tennessee this weekend. And I thought about it, you know, for Easter, the whole thing. Where they live, I survived two days. <laughs> Wait, you live in Tennessee? No, no, I live here. Okay. Where my wife is from, the city where she's from, it's... What city? Yeah. It's... Uh, it's close to M- Milan, Tennessee. Okay. It's a little, uh, like 20 minutes from there. Yeah, my girl's from Memphis. And they have <clears throat> Lee's Fried Chicken, which is the only reason why I would get on that fucking plane. <laughs> like, if I get on that plane, it's for Lee's my Fried Motherfucking Chicken. It is delicious. It's not that Nashville spicy shit. Right, right. This is just good old fried chicken. Made by good old African American old school black people. They're all <laughs> overweight. You know what I'm saying? They got gloves on. They got flour all over their faces, but they fucking have pride in the chicken they yeah, make. Yeah, you know, I and, uh, I, and I felt like going. And, I, and but again, it's like I, I'm gonna get stuck there for uh, five days with them or whatever. And it's my f- my wife's time. Like, for me, it's my wife's time. Like, when when I'm there, she's worried about me. Like, what am I thinking? Yeah. She's trying to appease me. And I'm like, don't just worry about your mom and dad. You know, I go for a walk. I smoke a joint. I put an iPod on. I'm fucking happy. I mean, there's no jujitsu there. But you're married, right? Married, yeah. Oh, okay. Nine years, ten years. Yeah, I've been with her for 17. And uh, I, I did a movie for Nick Swanson years ago. And he called me in like the night before, and I said some dirty shit. And but my scene was with Don Johnson, and him and I got stuck in a room because we'd have to. I met and, him. I met him. Yeah, and he at the time I don't know how old I was, but people were congratulating him because he just had a kid. And I go, in the back of my mind, oh, you creepy, selfish motherfucker, having a kid over fifty. Yeah, what right, are you right. thinking? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. what are you thinking? Doctor Laura talked about that one time. Whatever, but uh, uh, Don Johnson, I met at a wedding, uh, John Branca's wedding, uh, who is a very famous uh, attorney that Poison used. He was also Michael Jackson's attorney. I met Michael Jackson that same night, the one and only time I met Michael Jackson, who was very cool, by the way, very cool. I was introduced to Michael Jackson through Quincy Jones. And Elvis told me never. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but uh, it sounds like a joke. Like I'm about ready. Like I'm just like bringing up fucking names. But Don Johnson was there, and I talked to him for maybe three minutes. Very nice guy. He's talking to other people. Then when he went to leave the the reception. He went around and said, hey, it was nice meeting you, Dick. Hey, Ricky, it was nice meeting you. Hey, Jane, nice meeting you. He remembered every fucking person's name that he met that he had never met before. It blew me away. Blew me away. I said, I want to be able to do that. I still can't do it. Well, that, I walked into a room. I can't remember. That's funny because when I worked with him, I had heard all the Miami Vice stuff and stuff. And it was one of the best mornings of my life. I treated him like one of the guys I had known. We started talking about movies. And next thing you know, I looked at him and I go... One night I was in Galena Street having a cocktail in 1984 and I heard a bunch of yelling and screaming and it was Don Johnson at the heat of Miami Vice. He was living in Aspen. I was living in Snowman's Village. I was in a bar in Aspen and I remember hearing all these screams. I guess he walked into the wrong fucking bar where there was like 90 women 
and they chased him out. All we, all you could see is his bodyguard and Don Johnson running down the street, <laughs> and ninety yeah, fucking he, dude, women. He was the shit. He right? was the shit. You know, by eighty five, white fucking loafers, and you know all that shit. Don't you wish he could get away with wearing white fucking loafers? He used to wear the Man, shit. He brought that. Let's style. bring that shit back. Yeah, with right? no socks on. Yeah, no socks. I wear, Fuck I wear no socks for one day. My feet smell like ten oh, dead bodies. Oh no, yeah, no. Don Johnson's do putting yeah. on fucking sneakers with no socks. <laughs> I know you got to go. Uh, what do you think of this? Because this is what's important. Can you believe when you started this band, Paris, in 1986, was it? Uh, well, we started, no, we moved out here in, in 86, 84. 84. We started the band in like, I mean, Brett and I had, had been in another band before uh, the, what became Poison. And we were doing all the work. And the other two guys just were not working it. They, they had an excuse for everything. And uh, <clears throat> so that's why we started Poison. And the, we started it with the idea in mind that we wanted to see, or we wanted to be, everything that we wanted to see in a band. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. We wanted the music to be there. We wanted people to look cool. We wanted it to be a, a exciting on stage, the, the, uh, the dynamic on stage, all that stuff. We created, we set out to create that as fans, like as a fan, what do I want to see? And that's what we pursued with Poison. Uh, we couldn't do it with the other guy. <clears throat> so we tried to make it happen in PA, but it was limited. Like I said, you know, we were able to go to Maryland and play shows and things like that and then start, but it was happening here. This is where rock and roll was happening. Heavy metal, all that was happening in Los Angeles. There was fertile ground for what we were doing. It was not happening back east, not that much. A little bit. There were some good bands that came out of there. Of course, Kicks is amazing. Wrathchild uh, um, America. I mean, there were some great bands that came out uh, from there. Uh, the Dead End Kids, all these great bands. But it, we, the timing, the, our age, all that stuff, we just couldn't make it fly back there. You know what I mean? Uh, it was always going to stay just at this level. You know, we wanted, we were shooting higher than that. Who does most of songwriting for you guys? Like the first we were, three We wrote albums. together. We, you we, and we would Brent. get, no, we would get in just like a garage band. You know, we get in a rehearsal room or, you know, we lived on Washington Avenue. We, you know, it was just a, a room, basically. Um, we just get together and start playing, you know. Somebody come up with a riff. Hey, I come up with a riff or... I'm in the mood for this and you know do you ever do this and do you ever hear this song and I had this guy you know and we just work on it together like that I love that I love we we are literally a garage band you know what I mean that figured out how to take it to an arena level I, I really honestly stick I mean, by I, that I, description that, that was my next question I mean in 1984 when you came out here I mean what was what were you thinking? What was going to be the final result? Did you we had Kim Fowley was interested in us. Kim Fowley, I don't know if you know who he is, uh, was. Uh, he produced The Runaways. He's famous for The Runaways. Uh, but he's kind of like an idol maker. There's not many of those guys left in the world anymore, especially in rock. Uh, Malcolm McLaren's probably the last living idol maker. Um but, you know, he, he wrote a lot of songs, Alley Oop and all this stuff back in the day. But he would create bands and concepts and try to turn it into something. And he fell in love with what we were doing. He had heard a demo and said, you guys got to come out. So we tried to work with him. And he said something to me one time, our whole band, actually. He said, people do things around rock and roll they will never do in normal life. And I'll never forget that because he was so right. He was crazy. He died a couple years ago. He was crazy and he was a very underhanded guy, but he was very brilliant. And some of the things he said, it just have stuck with me all these years. Um, but he sort of taught us a little bit how to survive in L.A. because it's a different vibe out here. I mean, it, it isn't, it, you know, you have to, if you're, not, if you're not hustling, you're getting hustled. I mean, that's L.A. That is fucking L.A. But did you see... Like arenas and shit. I mean, in the beginning, was that what you guys were thinking? Or Did I see what? Arenas. I mean, hell no. Fuck no. Like, we you didn't just, know that. You just guys wanted to get signed to maybe open up for Aerosmith. You would have been good with that. We were very lucky. I mean, the first tour we got was Quiet Riot. We went out with Quiet Riot. Now, they were on their way down, unfortunately, at that time. Um, and they weren't doing that well. But they were still playing big clubs, some, you know... 
some smaller arenas, some uh, theaters, a lot of clubs at that time, but it was big time for us, dude. You know, and that was like our shot. And we went out there and we, we did everything we could on that tour. When our record came out and we released Cry Tough, um, it didn't do that well. Cry Tough's a great song, and I believe in those words, you know what I mean? The lyrics to that song. Uh, somebody put it in their yearbook, as a matter of fact. It's a, uh, somebody showed me some time ago. Um, <coughs> but it didn't light up the phones at MTV. I mean, it just didn't work. And so the record company said, you know, unless you get a tour or something, we're going to have to go back to the drawing board. Um, and so we said, hmm. That's when we managed to finagle the Rat Tour. Rat, those guys liked us. We were creating enough buzz without a successful single that they wanted to put us out on the road. What year was that? That was 86. That was... Uh, that was 86, that approximately. Was lay It Down tour. Yeah, lay I think so. Lay It Down. Yeah, yeah, I think it was the second record, like... That's right, because the first one was Rat and Roll. They, no, first, they released a four-song EP first. Right, right. With but it wasn't Wanted that. Man and right, something right. else. Then they released an album. Then the second one, whatever the fuck. I but know. because of getting the Rat tour, Enigma Records said, we'll give you another single, but we're not going to give you that kind of money for a, for a video again, because it didn't work. And we said, just give us a video. We'll make it work. So it was a very inexpensive video, which is why Talk to Me has no continuity to it it's like we don't have time to make all this have all this perfect filmatic continuity we're just gonna make it a fucking party like we're having a party we're doing this video there's the cameras there's the camera guys put them all in it's all fun let's just do it you know what i mean and it i think that energy translated because when that video came out on mtv people really connected with it they connected with the fun aspect of the song, the fact that we were just really, really wanting to take fun rock and roll to another level. You know what I mean? We were living in absolute shit at that time. So you fantasize about what would it be like if you were playing arenas and we did have all the things that we wanted. We'd write songs about how we wanted our life to be. You know what I mean? Not how it was, <laughs> but how we wanted it to be. And we weren't going to like bathe in our own shit and write all these shitty lyrics. Some people t did it that way, but we didn't. We were like fantasize. We're going to be positive. We're going to come up. And that song just connected. And, and, uh, and it's one of the, when I did meet Michael Jackson back to that for a second, he said that was one of the funnest videos he's ever seen. That was pretty cool. So when somebody else would cut us down and say, oh, Poison sucks, it's like, look, Michael Jackson loved our video, so fuck you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, David Bowie likes our video, fuck you. You, know? <laughs> you, guys a, you guys had a lot of great videos. I mean, MTV, it's a shame to see that I grew up on MTV. You know, like mm -hmm. I grew up on fucking MTV. And now I turn it on and some fucking pregnant chick and she can't afford the kid and she's married to Bruno. I fucking You know what? It's it, uh, I we I think Poison was really meant for that that medium. It that was medium, a perfect that, timing. It all worked. Yeah. I mean, uh, Brett works great in that medium. I think uh, all of us, you know, CC's great in front of the, you know, right uh, up front in front of the camera. Um, you know, I mean, it's just I think synergistically our band just works so well in the in the video medium. It just and at that time they approach videos like they were little movies. I mean Marty Collner and all these amazing video directors, they went after it like they were doing a film. Remember right? by the time they got you know? the Smuggler's Blues? Remember Glenn Fry, yes. Smuggler's Blues? Yeah, yeah. That was a short fucking film. God, Thriller came out. Thriller when, was I mean, a geez, short come film. on. Aerosmith, with the videos they were making, forget about I it. I still like, remember sitting at home with our buddies in 1982 because Aldo Novo was the midnight yeah. New Year's Eve. With Al, and I'm like, who the fuck is Aldo Novo? Yeah, that guy's a good guitar player. Yeah, he's a great guitar player. <laughs> and I heard that years later, he's written like, like he's still around writing songs for fucking yeah. people. Yeah, when he's, does, he's the real deal. When does this tour start now? Which we start uh, May 18th here in Irvine, and we finish now in Florida. I want to say Miami, I believe. Don't quote me on that. On the 1st of May. Or not May. For, uh, July. 1st of July, yeah. So we go May to July. It's a quick tour, but it's big cities. It's, uh, you know, we're hitting it hard. 
Um, uh, it's going to be awesome. I mean, original lineup, everybody, you know, Cheap Tricks out there with us. Pop Evil's a great band. I mean, it's it's going to be a blast, man. It's a what a way to kick off spring, you know. Ricky, next time I have you on, I want you to come on earlier so we can talk longer. I hate putting people into traffic. Oh yeah, so what the, time is it? Anyway? It's uh, three forty-five. Oh. So I want to get <laughs> yeah. you out of here. I just want to tell you, I love you with all my heart. Uh, ever since I met you, you've been a gentleman. You know the jujitsu thing. You inspired me that day with Danny and the Santo. How sweet you are. And I know you, what you've been through, and you're a fucking soldier, and I love you. Thank and you. And you man. always have Appreciate an open it. door here, and uh, you know we'll support. It's tomorrow the tour. too, soon? No, no, <laughs> you, you, you can come back whenever the hell you want. I, I just I want to do a two hours just talking about arm bars. Shit, you know, because yeah. that's we I know you, you know. love it. Then next time we'll do symbols, dude. The you know time, what? We'll I mean, if if you know, if I felt like I could keep everybody in my vlog, I've done some uh, jujitsu stuff. It doesn't get the most um, response. You know, people like it. You know what I mean? Well, but not this week. But people but don't get it the same way. I wish I want to do a film so bad, just so you know, about jujitsu and grappling. So that people, some way for people to really, really understand what's going on. Because, I mean, I was like, uh, 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 um, uh, who is it, um, the uh, middleweight champion right now, uh, uh, the black dude who's amazing. Tyrone Woodley. Ty yes. He was talking, uh, uh, he did an interview, and he's talking about Damian Maya, where it's like Damian Maya sometimes will act like he's getting beat up. So that they'll go in for the kill. And when they go in for the kill, that's when he grabs that's a hold of you. Hold okay, of you. And, and these are the types of things that people, the average person, has no clue about. They don't know what's going on in the mind of of, uh, of grapplers. You know, punching is a little more obvious. You know, you swing and you hit the guy. Okay, but grappling, it's so subtle. You move your hip this way, you lean the weight this way, all this shit. You know what I mean? Hickson calls it invisible jujitsu. All the stuff that happens that isn't obvious to the naked eye. And I would love to do a film or some special or a documentary that really concentrates on getting people to understand what is going on. Maybe in slow motion, maybe with narrative, maybe a combination of both. But I'd like to talk to you about that. When sometime. does the vlog get released? I, I'm on vlog 13, uh, number 13 already. So okay, I have so 13 when, vlogs already. And your YouTube page is yeah. what? Uh, it's Ricky Rocket. Ricky Rocket. Yeah. And, and it's you Rocket Vlog. And you release the vlogs when? Uh, usually on Wednesdays, but Wednesday. sometimes I do it Tuesday. It depends on the kids' I schedule. I want to ask your permission for something. Is it okay, not this week coming, the following week, if I pay Magno and come down and you teach me a move on camera and we put it on the vlog? Let's do it. A Fuck yeah. simple yeah. sweep to Kimura... I'll be more than happy to do it. I with will you. teach you the rock star roll up. No, but this no, is what I'm like, talking yeah. about. <laughs> <laughs> Let me give some shout outs real quick and I'll get you out of here. Austin Moneyball, Schmachter, Steven Cruz, Bob Lalingus, I love you. Barrow Yexley, Matt Borges, Sherry Roback, Danny Porter, and Steve Robbins. Listen, you always got to eat. And you know me, we opened up with Blue Apron. Blue Apron is offering our listeners. $30 off your first delivery. When it comes to dinner, let Blue Apron take care of the planning and shopping while you do the cooking and the eating, all right? You'll enjoy delicious meals like popcorn chicken with Swiss chili cabbage slaw and cumin spice wonton noodles with vegetables and peanuts on the table in 30 minutes or less with the incredible ingredients and chef design recipes. Blue Apron lets you see what the power of food can be. Listen, they deliver it fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and you get a step-by-step -step little card. The cook can be done in under 45 minutes. And the menu changes weekly based on what's in season and designed by Blue Apron's in-house culinary team. All right? Do me a favor. Check out this week's menu. Look at this beautiful thing. See it salmon with lemon, lamne, and frika, zucchini, and dates. What are you, nuts? Cuban spice wonton noodles with vegetables and peanuts, seared steaks with lemon parmesan kale and roasted potatoes, and here's the look, 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 look. whoa, whoa, Tugarashi popcorn chicken with sweet chili cabbage patch. Listen, you don't even, you can't even, you have a hard time making an egg, and now you're making recipes like this, so do me a favor. 
Check out this week's menu like I told you. Fill out the information. And I'm going to get you $30 off at blueapron.com slash Joey. Just go to blueapron.com slash Joey, pressing Joey on the checkout, and I'm going to get you $30 off your first order. You know why? Because Blue Apron is a better way to cook. Number two, let me tell you something. I'm no uh, Mickey Stallone. You know what I'm saying? I'm just a true blue type of guy. But when I tell you something, I tell you something to the end. Me undies is the way to go. When I go to jiu-jitsu, I got me undies on. When I got sweats, they got me undies on. It's not only that they, they use the Lensig Micro Modal in their underwear, and they're the softest things in the world. It's not all that stuff. Not every month they change patterns and you get different designs. It's not that that they have a 100% satisfaction money-back guarantee. And me undies guarantees you'll love their undies or you get their money back. You know what it is? That point-blank fucking serious, they're the best underwear out in the market. They shape your balls. They keep you dry. There's no fucking odors. They pull the sweat away from your skin. And that's how good they are, plain and fucking simple. Now, today, right now. Stop fucking around with your shitty fucking underwears. MeUndies has a great offer for my listeners and for any of my first-time purchases. When you purchase any MeUndies, you'll get 20% off and free shipping. How's that one for you? You can't get that deal nowhere. MeUndies is so sure you'll love the underwear, they're going to offer you 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't love your first pair, bam! You get a full refund. It's a no-brainer. Get 20% off your, fa- your first pair of the most comfortable underwear you'll ever fucking put on. Plain and simple. You know I'm your Uncle Joey. I'm family. Go to MeUndies.com right now. Pick out a beautiful fucking pair. Pick one out for your girlfriend. I'm going to give you 20% off, free shipping, and 100% satisfaction guarantee. Just by going to MeUndies.com slash Joey. That's MeUndies.com slash Joey. A better way to go. You know what I'm saying? Don't forget, I'm at the Ice House April 14th, and I'm at the Funny Bone 420 weekend. Thank you very much for coming on, Ricky. It's been a fucking blast. I've been wanting to have you on for two or three years, and uh, you made my fucking week. Have a great fucking week. And anything you, you want to tell these people just to talk. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Christ killer. Stay black, baby. Let's All close right. up with some with some poison here. Thank you again, man. Thank you. This is us. 